All right, before we begin, let me uh, point your attention towards the screens because last week I was not here. I was in Charleston, Illinois, visiting the Ashley family, which we sent out last September to plant uh, Woodlawn Chapel. So my young son Luke and I left about 6 a.m. and we drove to three and a half hours. Takes three if you drive straight through. Three and a half if you stop at Love's gas station uh, each way, which we are committed to do, compelled, as it were, by our spirit to do. So we had a great time with them. Uh, they are doing great. Uh, that's what you look like after you eat tater tot casserole, which I'd never had before. And we had a wonderful time worshiping with them. And so you can continue to pray for them. They've had some salvations and they baptized people. And even though it was snowing sideways, there was a pretty good turnout. So it's exciting to see what the Lord's doing up there, uh, you know, and they're an extension of us. Back to what we've been doing here. Let's get to Isaiah chapter 58. And you guys came out on a 10 degree morning and you're going to be blessed by a message on fasting. <laughs> Now, um, to catch you up to speed, everything that we have covered uh, since chapter 53 flows from that chapter. So in chapter 53, we've told you we kind of have uh, what's been called the Mount Everest of Bible prophecy as it pertains to the Messiah in the Old Testament. So chapter 53 of Isaiah is this detailed description of of the Messiah 700 years before he would arrive. And then everything else flows from his person and his work. So chapter 54, we have the restoration of Israel, even though at this time, the time of this writing, they're in a great state of disrepair. In chapter 55, we have an invitation to the Gentiles, which up to this point had been almost unheard of. The Jews didn't think the Gentiles were even worthy of hearing the good news of the Jehovah God they worshipped. In chapter 56, we then have the conditions of the kingdom where both Jews and Gentiles will be together, and we're a part of that in the Christian church. And then in chapter 57, he beckons backsliders, backsliders beckon to turn to the Lord. And so when we arrive in chapter 58, part of their backslidden condition was that they needed to fix their fasting. Now a fast is by definition to abstain from all or some kinds of food or drink, especially as a religious observance. Now one of the most famous fasters in recent history worldwide was not a Christian, but in fact uh, he was a man named Mahatma Gandhi. He was uh, a Hindu and uh, he was actually an ardent student of the New Testament, specifically the Sermon on the Mount. He read it over and over and over, and he actually tried to live by the Sermon on the Mount. And part of both his Hindu religion and his reading of the Sermon on the Mount, those things together, they led him uh, to fast. And so Gandhi uh, walked around barefooted most of the time. Uh, he uh, had rough feet because of that. Calluses on his feet. He fasted for days on end for spiritual and political reasons. And so he wasn't very strong physically. He was this little bitty man. And uh, because of fasting, if you've ever fasted, you know that fasting lends itself to bad breath. So uh, it's been said that Gandhi was a super calloused, fragile mystic hexed by halitosis. <laughs> so, all that said, I was uh, sniffing around on the worldwide interwebs and on fasting websites, and I, I found this opening paragraph from one I thought I'd share it with you. It says, fasting. For many non-liturgical Christians, the thought of fasting triggers strong emotions of disdain as though the experience was overtly alien or unnatural. Yet, Jesus was unmistakably clear about this painful topic he said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, that the days will come when the bridegroom, that was him, would be taken away from them, that is, his disciples, and then they will fast, that is, his followers. This means that fasting is, or ought to be, part of the normal Christian life. Stated differently, normal Christians fast, only abnormal Christians seek to avoid it. So with that riveting opening, 
Look at chapter 58, verse 1. This is God to the prophet, and he says, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, and tell my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and they did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take delight in approaching God. But then, here's their question. Because they did all this, then they say, verse 3, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? And why have we afflicted our souls, and you did not notice? So the people's presumption was that if they worshipped, and they did, and they studied the word of God, and they did, and they fellowshiped, which they hung out with other uh, Israelite believers, and they did. And they fasted, which they did. That then, because they did these things, surely God would notice them and would hear them. But the problem is, He doesn't. So they say, why have we done all these things? Why have we afflicted our souls, but God doesn't notice us? Why does He seem to be ignoring us? Why are all these bad things happening to us? And it's because, the Lord would say, in fact, verse 3, in the day of your fast you find pleasure or you sin and you exploit all your laborers. God wasn't noticing their fast because the people in the middle of the fast kept on living for themselves. They didn't change the way they lived. And so they thought that because they were doing these processes of worship, that they would be received even though they weren't changing inwardly. But because the people kept on living for themselves and they weren't submitted to the Lord, then the truth is there was no growth and the Lord was not, if you will, engaging them where they were at. So what we find is the Lord then says, Indeed, you fast, verse 4, for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. And you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is this the fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to, he says, afflict his own soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? He asked them, would you call this an acceptable fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Now, the people were fasting faultily. They had faulty fasting. And yet the people fasted both frequently and uh, extravagantly. Now the idea of fasting, as I have here for you, goes all the way back to Leviticus. It originates in that book that you love to spend all your time in, I know, Leviticus. And uh, there, it was connected with the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is the highest of the Jewish holy days. It's the one day a year when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat to make atonement for the people's sins for that year. And in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29, it says that this shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger that dwells among you. Now, the phrase, afflict your own souls, has nothing to do originally with fasting, but the Jews begin to interpret it as such. And so they believe that every Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement, that they were to fast. And indeed, they do it to this day if they are devout Jews. When I lived in San Diego, I lived in this kind of upscale neighborhood, and there were a lot of Jewish neighbors there in that neighborhood. And there was one particular uh, rather nice uh, Chinese restaurant. Oddly enough, it was a very beautiful and nice uh, Chinese buffet. And so what would happen is that every Yom Kippur, then the Jews would fast all day long. And then in the evening when Yom Kippur was over, they would break the fast uh, by pigging out, <laughs> pun intended, at the Chinese uh, buffet. And so you couldn't get into the Chinese buffet after Yom Kippur from Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. Now, uh, 
what they would do in the time of Isaiah is they wouldn't just fast on Yom Kippur, but they would fast regularly. The more devout they were, the more fasting they would do. And they were, look, they were bowing their heads down like bulrushes. They were making a big show of this thing. And so what the Lord says is, you fast frequently and extravagantly, but while you're fasting and you're making this big to-do of your fast, then you exploit your employees. You're stingy. You don't pay them what they're worth. And uh, you strive and debate amongst yourselves. And uh, then, in fact, you're violent. And so their outward act, because of those things, had no inward impact. And by the time you get to Jesus, you find that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, I have it there for you, verses 16 through 18, he says to his disciples, moreover, notice when you fast, not if you fast. When you fast as a disciple of Christ, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. And he said, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, what he was telling them was don't be like, and this would have been the Pharisees, the religious rulers of the day. And from what I've read historically, they would fast by Jesus day on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which were market days. And so while everybody was there at the market, then they would show up and they would have sackcloth on their heads and they'd be weeping. Oh, my body's in such turmoil for not eating. I'm just struggling spiritually. And people would be like, wow, how pious, how pure, how holy. You know, I just stopped at Burger King and these guys are fasting, you know. And so they would draw attention. And Jesus said, if they're drawing attention like that, then they have their reward. Now, the problem with fasting is that often we do it, maybe not as hypocritically if we do it at all as the Pharisees, but we do it to get something. And I have found that in my fasting, and for years I fasted every uh, Wednesday night at sundown until Thursday night at sundown. For about a decade I did this, and then uh, when uh, the Lord blew up my GI tract, I decided that it probably wasn't healthy. In fact, it hurt more to fast than it did to not fast. And so I've been on like a five-year hiatus, and so I'm now working my way personally and practically back into fasting. But then I had this situation a couple weeks ago. I alluded to the message. I had a whopper of a thing come into my life, so I fasted for three days. And uh, then right in the middle of my fast, I, um, I blew it like a maniac with one of my best friends. I mean, more in the flesh than I've, I've been in a long time. Uh, violent, by the way. Not physically, but from the inside out. And I was like, Lord, why is this happen when I'm trying to be the most godly? I'm fasting that then the flesh, you know, it rears its ugly head. And this is the thing that dominates me. And then here I am studying chapter 58 of Isaiah. And the Lord says, well, it's because you're not really fasting for the right reasons. You're actually fasting to get something from me. And that's actually a fleshly act. So when the flesh is the thing that you engage, while the spirit is definitely willing, the flesh is weak. And when you feed the flesh, that sucker comes roaring out. So these people had the same type of thing happening. God says, hey, you do all this, but then you've got your reward. So in verse 6, he says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Here's what a fast that I have chosen looks like. You don't take care of the sin in your life when you fast and so it doesn't turn out the way you hoped. But this is the fast that I have chosen. To loose the bonds of wickedness, verse 6, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and you break every yoke. Is it not, he says, to share your bread with the hungry and to bring to your house the poor who are cast out? And when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. So godly fasting. Now, there are many men and women in the Bible that fasted. On the left-hand side of your screen, I kind of put up there maybe the who's who of fasting in the Bible. The fasting hall of fame, if you will. Moses, Elijah, David, Daniel, Esther, maybe the most famous faster. Jesus, and then Paul. And by the way... As it pertains to fasting, there are different types of biblical fasts. 
So the first one is called a regular fast, and it would be what Jesus did in the wilderness. Forty days he did not eat, but it doesn't say anything about him not drinking. So a regular fast would be I abstain from food altogether, but I do drink liquids. A partial fast would be found in Daniel, the first chapter where Daniel doesn't want to eat Nebuchadnezzar's delicacies that had been sacrificed to idols. So he petitions the chief eunuch to allow him to eat only vegetables and drink water. And this would be a partial fast. It's sometimes called a Daniel fast. And then uh, the Apostle Paul in chapter 9 engaged in what we would call an absolute fast. You can't do these uh, very long or a full fast. And at his conversion, while he was trying to decide what was going on after the Lord knocked him off his horse on the way to Damascus, there at Ananias' house on a street called Straight, he fasted fully from water and food for three days until his eyes were opened. Now the fourth fast is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and it's a sexual fast. And thank you, Lord, I'm not teaching that chapter this morning. In fact, it's a fast where a husband or a wife would abstain from each other sexually for a time uh, for godly purity and holiness. <laughs> Oddly enough, I've never had a marital counseling session where that was actually a problem. Now, all that said, moving on. <laughs> godly fasting is fasting connected uh, to and about uh, humility, and I should have inserted there holiness and repentance. That fasting is about uh, coming near to the heart of God, and it's, it's closely connected and usually for humility and holiness being set apart and repentance. And the prophet Joel writing to a nation that was even more downtrodden and backslidden than the one that Isaiah wrote to says, yet even now declares the Lord return to me with all your heart with, look, fasting and weeping and mourning. Now, the Lord desires that we fast because what fasting does is it quiets the flesh in order for you and I to hear and obey the Spirit. Now, you and I have a problem. We were created uh, perfectly. In the image of God, that's what Genesis chapter 1 tells us. And uh, there are people that have proposed, and if you've been coming here long enough, you've heard me share this theory, that Adam and Eve, before the fall, they were created in God's image, but they actually were a triunity like you and I, in the sense that created in God's image, a part of that is they were body, soul, and spirit, a triunity. Uh, or body, uh, mind, and spirit, you might say. Soul and mind is interchangeable. But before the fall, some people have supposed that Adam and Eve actually wore their spirit on the outside as a garment. And they, uh, since God is spirit, actually related to God. The idea is that the spiritual dominated them. So they were spirit first, uh, mind second, and then body. We don't have time to go into the reason for all that. But at the fall, then what happened when they catered to their flesh instead of the spirit, then the spirit retreated inside. And now what are we cloaked with? The flesh, the body. And then typically we are ruled by the mind. And finally, and lastly, the spirit. That's the way we are carnally. So what the Lord desires is he desires for us to bring that spirit that's so willing out from and above the flesh that is so weak. And to do this, he encourages fasting. Because fasting quiets my flesh. And I remember uh, that I was at a workshop one time at a Calvary Chapel pastor's conference, a workshop on fasting. And uh, this is how popular fasting is, even with... Uh, pastors. This conference was maybe 1,800 pastors, and so we would all be together for worship, and then they had all these different workshops you could go to, and I picked fasting, and it was held in a room about this size, and there were 30 of us in there. <laughs> and the little guy leading the fasting workshop, he's like, we're going to talk about fasting today. He's very feminine, very, he's just very very kind and weak and kind of just gone and we're going to 
build up our spiritual selves. And people are looking around like, what did we get ourselves into? How do I get out of the fasting workshop? So they, he starts asking us questions after he talks a bit about fasting. And then, and so there are people like apparently raising their hands. I try to be a good student. So I'm down on the second row, not the first row, but I'm on the second row and I can't really look around because I don't want to look, see, and people are answering his questions. And, and then finally he, he poses this question, why do we fast? You know, and so this, this elicits a couple different responses. And then from the back of the room, uh, way in the back, uh, somebody goes, because it quiets my flesh. <laughs> and I was like, what in the world? You jumped. It, it was a Calvary Chapel pastor. He's kind of well known named Ken Graves Big. He always big buff guy wearing t-shirts that are too small for him all the time, you know, and God, godly guy. But I was like, Ken, you're screaming about your flesh being quieted. Something seems wrong to me here. But I, but I always remembered uh, what he said because he was spot on. Th this is what fasting is actually about. It's to quiet my flesh so that I push the spirit to the surface so I can hear through the spirit and then not just hear but actually obey. And while these guys were doing sacrifice as a religious, you know, as you will, uh, calisthenic. The truth is that in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, God said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire you to be kind and the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And what I find is the truth in my heart, it's easier for me to do a religious service than it is to love people who are unlovable <clears throat> or to actually uh, care about people that I don't see the same uh, way as. In James chapter 1, verse 27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. It's to look on orphans and widows in their time of need and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And it's so much easier to attend church or sing a worship song or read my Bible than it is to love people. And so God says, what I want to do is I want you to deny the flesh, which is all about me, and I, I want you to allow the spirit to be able to speak into uh, your life. And if you do that, then there's going to be some results because this is what's practically righteousness, right living. And verse 8 begins to list those results of righteousness. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. God's light's going to shine through you. And your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. God's glory will shine through you if you live practically righteous. And then verse 9, you shall call and the Lord will answer and you shall cry and he will say, here I am. That's a nay nay. Here I am. Now, that said, the Lord's glory will shine through me if I'm practically righteous. And here's the thing, the Lord will hear me and he will answer me because here is a truth biblically that is hard for some of us to get our minds around. And the psalmist said it in chapter 66, verse 18. He said, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. If we have sin in our heart that we know we need to let the Lord deal with, he will not hear our prayers. It's not to say we can have sin. If we have sin that we don't know about, that's a different deal. But if I have sin in my heart that I don't confess and turn from, then it doesn't matter how much I pray, he won't hear me. And years ago, I realized that one of the reasons that the Lord didn't seem to be answering my prayers is because a man's prayers will be hindered if he does not treat his wife with honor, both publicly and in secret, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And I was such a turd husband, there was no possible way the Lord would hear my prayers. Now that said... Uh, here is the high-tech, redneck, Farmington uh, version that most men give me about their life if they're not really hitting on all cylinders for the Lord. If they, if they know of the Lord or maybe they attend church, and I hear this a lot, I may not do this or this or this, and I know the Lord wants me to change this or this or this, but I pray every night. And so I try to look patient and nod, but inside I think, whoop de do. God doesn't hear your prayers. If you know he's supposed to, he wants you to change this or this or this, and he's given you by Christ shed blood on the cross the power to change that thing. If you and I don't 
change that thing. If we don't repent and let him have that thing, then whoop de doo pray all you want. He's not going to hear your prayers. That's the long and the short of it. But the results of righteousness are, even if I'm struggling with a thing, if I give it to him, I fail. I give it to him and I fail. If I give it to him and I fail, still, where there's struggle, there is life. And so when I'm repenting of a thing and letting him work that thing out in me, then the result of righteousness is I will hear the Lord and he will answer me. And that's the beautiful thing about our God. Now, also look with me. He says, if, verse 9, you take away the yoke from your midst and the pointing uh, of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and you satisfy the afflicted soul, then look, your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday and the Lord will guide you. So the Lord will turn my darkness into night if I live righteously, practically righteous, he will also uh, then guide me continually and he'll satisfy my soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And here's the interesting thing. God says, I'll actually satisfy uh, your soul in drought and I'll strengthen your bones. There's a connotation there spiritually and physically. And the truth is that there are many benefits to fasting, both spiritually and physically. And so I don't have time to go into all of the physical benefits, nor am I a doctor, so I wouldn't listen to me if I did take the time. But I have read, and I do know myself, that when one can fast, then physical health and spiritual vitality improve significantly in a Christian fast. And so the Lord says, I want to I want to guide you. I want to turn your darkness into light. I want to answer you. I want my glory to shine through you. I want to water your thirsty soul. And all this can be had if you set aside the flesh for just a little bit. And then look at verse 12. Those from among you shall build the old waste places, he says. And you shall Raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. And the truth is that what God wants to do with the person who will deny the flesh and let the spirit begin to reign is he will indeed begin to work in us and repair our breaches and restore us and rebuild the old waste places and then he will use us to be repair of other people's breaches and restore other people's waste places and to build new streets and paths in their life. And this verse means a lot to me because uh, this is the verse God gave me years ago when I first stepped foot on uh, this property. There are two pictures of this property in 2006. I don't know how well you can see them, but let's just say it didn't look good. In fact, uh, we had a church attendance of about 20 people, and I went out to visit my pastor. This is after a full year here, and we were meeting over in the factory. We had moved out of my basement, and my pastor said, hey, you need to pray about buying land. And I said, Ray, uh, thanks for that, but we have 20 people coming. And Ray's not a forceful man, but Pastor Ray said, you just go home and pray. So I thought, well, this is my spiritual father. I better go do what he says. So at that time, Dave Williams and I were praying in my basement floor. We would about two hours a day get together several days a week. And we'd lay on my floor and pray while my labradoodle licked his ears. And uh, so I told him and we decided, we said, well, we're going to, what would we pray for if we were looking for a building? We said, well, we'd like to have a building that uh, is either on a, a pretty busy highway or it had like a pond and some acreage so that someday we could, you know, have picnics and people could use it. And so we prayed for, I don't know, it was a week or two. And then Dave came to me and he said, I found it. I found the property. You got to come look at it. And I drove down here and I thought, this is the ugliest place I've ever seen in my whole life. There was shipping containers and there were junk cars parked everywhere, and the buildings were that puke yellow. 
And from the back, this pond had all these trees growing up all over it. And they were dumping all kinds of chunk rock right down here. And cars all over the street out there. And I thought, oh my gosh, how could this ever be the place? So I got out and I started walking. And I was thinking, man, I don't know what Dave could possibly have seen in this deal. And then I remembered, hold on, we asked for a major highway to be out front or a pond and it's got both and seven acres. And then I was walking around the pond and God, uh, he quoted to me in my spirit, Isaiah 58, 12. And he said, this is going to be a place where you're going to build up the old waste places and it's going to be called the repair of the breach. And I said, this is it. This is it, Lord. And what's funny is at that point, I kind of thought that had just a, uh, an implication for this property physically. But what I found over the years for this building and grounds, it's a reflection of how God's worked in my life and how he works in most people's lives. Uh, this thing, little by little, we've, we've mowed it, we've added fill rock to it, and we've cut down willow trees, and we've renovated the building, and, and we've put gravel down, and we've, we've tried to fertilize the lawn, and we bought the property next door that I live in. And, and I realize that's how God works in our Christian life. We never take all the land immediately. It looks like Parkland Chapel did in 06. And then he just begins to change it little by little, line upon line, here little, there little. And the truth is he doesn't change it all at once because we couldn't take it. If he changed it all at once, we wouldn't be able to handle the success. We all think we would, but we wouldn't. The beast of the field would overrun us. And so what he does is he allows us to take it little by little. And this place to me, is a picture of my Christian life. And the people that I've had the opportunity, many of you to, to serve with here for all these years, it, it's neat to get to watch you grow and to have hopefully you think it's neat to get to watch me grow. You know, we don't have as many weeds in our garden as we used to. We don't have as many junk cars sitting in the front. And here's, here's the awesome thing. I, I've always thought as we started fixing this place up that, you know, this place wouldn't be awesome if it was next to the Taj Mahal. Like nobody would be like Parkland Chapel rocks next to the Taj Mahal, but next to the friendly. <laughs> and that's what God does in our life, right? He puts us uh, next to things, maybe even some people where we can shine like diamonds, you know, even though we might not really be all that much a gem. Verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and you call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, if you call it honorable, and you shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high hills of the earth. And I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here at the end, he says to set apart the Sabbath. Now, Isaiah's had a lot to say about the Sabbath, so you can go back and listen to some of our messages on that. But he's saying here the Sabbath matters in that he desires that you set it apart. Now, the fourth commandment was originally written on stone. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But we know in the New Testament, neither fasting nor the Sabbath day are have-tos. They are get-tos. They are get-tos. While we are commanded to keep a Sabbath, it's for our own good because we need rest and it doesn't have to be Saturday or Sunday, but it needs to be a day. So that says, he says, what you need to do on your Sabbath is don't do your own pleasure on it. Call the Sabbath, uh, call the Sabbath a delight. I'm guessing if you showed up 10 degrees with a little snow on the ground, uh, you guys have done that and you make the holy day honorable. And if you do that, he says, then you're going to ride upon the high places of the earth. And notice, please, last phrase, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. He's saying, if you do this, no matter what your culture does, you're going to ride upon the high places, the high hills of the earth. The Lord's mouth spoke it. Now, that said, before we observe communion, which we're going to do this morning, I wanted to read you something uh, from my A.W. Tozer study Bible. I love A.W. Tozer. If you've never read him, he's one of the most passionate men of the last hundred years. Interestingly enough, uh, 
I went to visit Daniel Messiah, my Muslim friend turned Christian in North Carolina back in the summer, and we were touring a bookstore, and he saw me drooling over this A.W. Tozer study Bible. And, uh, and so before I left, he handed me a gift, and it was this A.W. Tozer study Bible, and I keep it in the box. It doesn't come out of the box. I carry it around like this holy thing. Like in uh, the Old Testament, they eventually called the, the serpent on the pole Nehushtan. I just call it the thing, Nehushtan with me. I love this thing so much. And A.W. Tozer, he's, he's no man to be trifled with. The Bible's in Old King James because I assume that's what A.W. Tozer taught out of. And I'm not an Old King James only guy. But I, I will say this, if it was good enough for A.W. Tozer and if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> but this little excerpt from his Bible kind of sums up, I think, everything we've talked about. Because the truth is, none of what we've talked about has anything to do with salvation. That's only had if you believe uh, in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead then you can be saved but past that this is about blessing and so I want to read you this if you please uh, would be directed towards the screen and uh, I want to close with this before we observe communion A.W. Tozer writes pick at random a score of great saints whose lives and testimonies are widely known. Let them be Bible characters or well-known Christians of post-biblical times, and you will be struck instantly with the fact that the saints were not alike. Sometimes the unlikenesses were so great as to be positively glaring. How different, for example, was Moses and Isaiah? How different was Elijah and David? How unlike each other were John and Paul or St. Francis and Luther or Fanny and Thomas a Kempis? The differences are as wide as human life itself. Differences of race, nationality, education, temperament, habit, and personal qualities. Yet they all walked each in his day upon a high road of spiritual living far above the common way. Their differences, and I love this, must have been incidental and in the eyes of God of no significance. But in some vital quality, they must have been alike. What was it? I venture to suggest that the one vital quality which they had in common was spiritual receptivity. Something in them was open to heaven. Something which urged them Godward. Without attempting anything like a profound analysis, I shall simply say that they had spiritual awareness and that they went on to cultivate it until it became the biggest thing in their lives. They differed from the average person in that when they felt the inward longing, they did something about it and they acquired the lifelong habit of spiritual response. They were not disobedient to the heavenly vision and as David put it neatly in the old King James, when thou saidest, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 27, 8. Father God, please give us the ability to respond to your spirit's call. If there's any in here that need you for salvation, let them respond and confess you as Lord. And if... Like me, there are many in here that need the Spirit pushed to the surface. Lord, convict us, correct us, maybe encourage us. And Father God, would you help us to find a place of spiritual receptivity and then respond. Let that be the one thing in our life that matters more than all other things. For when you are sought, you will be found. In Jesus' name. Amen.